Coming up on Market to Market. The U.S. trade deficit improves modestly, but agricultural exports soar to an all-time high. And the EPA gets an earful on its plan to reduce the amount of ethanol in America's fuel supply. Those stories and market analysis with Sue Martin and John Roach. Next. This is the Friday, December 6 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The United States produced 13.3 billion gallons of ethanol last year that was blended into an estimated 134 billion gallons of gasoline. At that level, the Environmental Protection Agency believes America is close to hitting the so-called blend wall, when no more gasoline is available to be blended with ethanol. In response, the Obama administration proposed cutting the renewable fuel standard in 2014 from the original mandate of 15.2 billion gallons of biofuel to 13.1 billion gallons. Green producers who sell their corn to ethanol plants say the biofuels industry is an effective hedge against low prices. And the ethanol industry touts the homegrown fuel's impact on retail gasoline prices, job creation, and emissions of greenhouse gases. On the other side of the, the debate, livestock producers claim the diversion of corn for fuel is driving up production costs. And the oil industry claims it's lost market share due to government mandates requiring ethanol in America's fuel supply. So to say the plan to cut ethanol blending requirements next year by 30 percent is controversial would be an understatement. And at a public hearing on the proposal in Washington late this week, EPA got an earful. There are many players in the debate that represent virtually every aspect of the food supply chain from grain farmers and animal producers to ethanol producers and oil refiners. Those in favor of cuts to the Renewable Fuel Standard, or RFS, seek relief from what they feel is the reason for higher feed and food costs. Those opposed to rolling back the RFS say the benefits of the grain-based fuel go beyond cleaner air. Statistics from the Renewable Fuels Association show the ethanol industry is directly responsible for nearly 90,000 U.S. jobs. According to proponents, those jobs add $43 billion to the nation's gross domestic product. I'm here today the issue is volatile enough that nearly 170 people lined up for a hearing held just outside the Washington Beltway in Virginia on Thursday to testify for or against the proposed cuts. The RFS was designed to drive investment in new technologies, to drive innovation, to drive new market opportunities. It was not designed to be convenient for the oil companies. The RFS is forcing market change. It's telling the oil companies business as usual can't happen. But I implore you throughout the day, listen to those people that are concerned about what this program does for rural America, what this program does for consumers, what this program does for investment in new technologies, and revise this rule. Among those wanting to make their voice heard were representatives of the American Petroleum Institute, or API, a trade association representing all aspects of U.S. petroleum production. API has encouraged that for the first time, EPA has acknowledged that the blend wall is a dangerous reality that must be addressed to avoid negative impacts on America's fuel supply and to prevent harm to American consumers. However, we will continue to call on Congress to repeal the RFS to protect consumers from this outdated and unworkable program. API leaders are concerned the mandate could cause severe fuel rationing, drive up the cost of gasoline by 30 percent by 2015, and lead to a $770 billion decrease in U.S. GDP as well as a $580 billion decrease in take-home pay for American workers. EPA's continued, tar continued tardiness has real adverse effects on our industry. Obligated parties need this information ahead of the compliance period to make operational, logistics, and investment decisions. Representatives of animal agriculture groups, including the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the National Turkey Association, and the National Chicken Council were in attendance. Congress created this mess, and ultimately, Congress can fix it. As corn comprises nearly 70 percent of the feed given to chickens, our single largest input cost, rising prices, directly affect farmers' bottom line. 
Since 2007, more than a dozen poultry companies have filed for bankruptcy, been sold, or simply closed their doors altogether, due in large part to the high feed costs brought on by the RFS. I want to emphasize that we are not against corn ethanol, we're not against ethanol. What we are against is the hand of government directing into this market and giving it false signals. And state and federal politicians were among those gathered, including the governor of the nation's top ethanol producing state. I'm here to share my strong opposition to this harmful proposal from the EPA and to emphasize the tremendous economic importance of the renewable fuel standard on our nation's agriculture, agribusiness, and biofuels industry. It's estimated that this EPA proposal will cost 45,000 jobs in this nation. We don't need to drive the number of people employed down. We need to drive it up. 45,000 families would face undue financial hardship and stress simply at the hands of the EPA catering to big oil, and they're not satisfied, they won't be satisfied till you repeal it all together. EPA's 60-day comment period on the issue closes on January 28th. The U.S. labor market revealed surprising strength Friday, suggesting that economic growth may have begun to accelerate. According to the Labor Department, U.S. employers added 203,000 positions to their payrolls in November. That means the economy added an average of 204,000 new workers per month between August and November. That's up more than 28 percent from the previous four-month period average of 159,000 new jobs. November's hiring spree pushed the U.S. unemployment rate down three-tenths of a point to a five-year low of 7 percent. And the Institute for Supply Management announced this week that its closely watched index of U.S. manufacturing activity rose in November to its highest level in two and a half years. The ISM report also revealed that U.S. exports increased at the fastest pace in nearly two years. And that development was corroborated earlier this week when the government released its latest estimates on global trade. The Commerce Department reported this week that America's cavernous trade deficit narrowed in October to $40.6 billion. That's down 5.4% from September, and the improvement beat preliminary estimates. U.S. exports rose by 2.7% to a record $192.7 billion. Total imports, meanwhile, increased modestly by four-tenths of a percent to top $233 billion. The improvement was powered by a 6% increase in petroleum exports. Lower global oil prices along with an increase in domestic energy production allowed for an 11.1% decrease in petroleum imports during the same time period. Controversial new drilling methods like hydraulic fracturing or fracking have helped breathe life into domestic energy production, thereby lessening America's dependence on foreign oil. Smaller trade deficits can boost economic growth because they generally indicate that U.S. companies are earning more from sales overseas, while U.S. consumers are buying fewer products from their foreign competitors. Through the first 10 months of 2013, the trade deficit was 10.6 percent below last year's pace. Most of that can be attributed to a gain in exports, while imports hovered at 2012 levels. The rise in exports comes on the heels of three months of declines. Analysts predict exports will continue to rise due to modest economic recoveries in Europe and Asia. U.S. exports to China soared to an all-time high of $13.1 billion in October. But Chinese exports to America also set a record at $41.9 billion. The resulting $28 billion trade deficit with China is America's largest monthly imbalance with any single country. But agriculture continues to be a bright spot in the U.S. trade picture. China's increased price supports for its farmers actually have eroded its competitiveness in the global marketplace. The U.S. appears to have capitalized on the opportunity, and USDA reports American agricultural exports soared to a record high of $140.9 billion in fiscal 2013. Next, the Market to Market Report. Stocks on Wall Street soared on the upbeat jobs report Friday. 
The Dow rose nearly 200 points in its best session in two months. Commodity markets, on the other hand, were more subdued. For the week, March wheat lost 12 cents, while the March corn contract moved 8 cents higher. Soybeans also rallied as the January contract settled with a weekly gain of 5 cents. Nearby meal prices broke ranks with the raw commodity in a decline of $2.25 per ton. In the softs, cotton traded higher again this week as the March contract advanced by nearly $2 per hundredweight. In the dairy market, December Class 3 milk gained 61 cents, while the January contract moved 82 cents higher. Over in livestock, February cattle lost $1.25, nearby feeders declined by 85 cents, and the February lean hog contract posted a weekly loss of $1.47. In the financials, the euro gained 12 basis points against the dollar, crude oil surged more than $5 per barrel, Comex Gold lost $9 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index advanced by 11 points to settle at 632.35. Here now to lend us their insight on these and other trends are two of our longtime market analysts, Sue Martin and John Roach. Welcome back. Thanks, Mike. We've got a big news in the broader economic market this week as we take a look at the jobs report and what's happening in the American economy as we watch the Dow rise and unemployment fall. Is this good news long-term for commodities? Sue, what do you think? Well, I think uh, the concern is when we get positive news towards our economy, I think it is good news for commodities in general over a longer, broader picture. But the concern is is that the Federal Reserve will um, move on with their plan to start cutting back on their um, uh, stimulus program on the uh, quantitative easing and that's a concern because it's always been thought that that was very commodity friendly. So the first thought will be that it, when they start into that program, when they announce it, um, that um, that will probably give the commodity markets in general a pullback or a break because money will stay with that sentiment into the stock market. However, that said, anybody that's trading the stock market, there's always been kind of a little bit of a tie positive stock market helps positive cattle market. All right, John, what do you think? I think Susie's exactly right. I think that on one hand, you have concern that the Federal Reserve uh, slows down its bond buying program and interest rates start to rise. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, economic news is turning positive. And, and, and it has been really for some months, the one that's been really slow to come along has been in the employment numbers. And, mm-hmm. and so finally we're seeing the, unemployment, or the employment numbers coming along. And, uh, and I think it's great news. And I think we really should look at this and say, this is great news. We have been exporting grain and exporting meats into a world that's been struggling to grow and to get anything going, and it's really starting to get something going now, and you have to look at that as positive, although the market traders will be nervous if interest rates start to rise and money starts to tighten, certainly, but the overall uh, prospect for solid cash-type demand uh, is definitely improved with these kind of economic numbers. A rising tide lifting all boats. Certainly does. Exactly. Now, as we talk about the global market, uh, we, we saw wheat continue its decline this week, basically on a large Canadian crop and large global global supplies. John, where is this market going to go in the, in the short term? Wheat markets just has no friends. I mean, it just keeps getting da- going down and going down and going down. And, and, and we just don't have anybody who wants to come in on the positive side of it. The speculative traders are at a record short position or a very near record short position. Uh, and so you have everybody leaning one way. And, and that tends to take care of itself. You tend to have something come along uh, that changes uh, people's attitudes and you see the market reverse and and the speculators have to get out of those short positions. But as of the end of the week, that that hasn't happened yet. There's nothing on the horizon. Well, and I think, too, our winter wheat crop went into dormancy under the best conditions it's had in several years. So that, too, kind of gives a little bit of an expectation that we're going to have a decent production this year. And granted, we've got a long ways to go, but that expectation's there. And in a a marketplace that's looking at global uh, supplies that keep increasing, that would be kind of an indication that we need to kind of keep our eyes open. Um, You know, the market is kind of lethargic, and if you have a weak corn market, certainly isn't going to help on on the, the wheat market. One thing about wheat, it was getting a little high priced as opposed to the corn price, so demand there left wheat 
going over to corn for feeding. Okay, so now uh, we're looking at the March wheats around 651. Are there any ranges that we should keep an eye on? Producers should keep watch over as it continues to slide? Well, I think that um, on the top side, of course, psychological is the $7 level. On the bottom, this is Chicago wheat, and on the bottom side, it's the 630 mark, 632, something like that. Okay. On KC, it's 740, 735, 740. Um, get up towards the 750 mark, and there's going to be static there. On the downside, would be about 680 to maybe 675. Okay. All right. We look for a rally in wheat. We think wheat is overdue for a rally, and uh, and we think we're on the verge of, of, and we started a bit of a rally, and then we got smacked down by Canada's crop estimate. Yeah. But but so we're we're on the we're on the side that says look for a rally. Wheat frequently will come up and make higher prices and and post some decent prices in the Jan Feb time frame. So seasonally, we're into a period when we should see some stronger prices. All right, and we just need that catalyst. So we'll add to that. Yes, absolutely. All right. Now, as we take a look at the corn market, uh, we've been seeing corn hang steady uh, between that four and a quarter to 440 mark. Is that going to last long term? Sue, where do you think this corn market's headed? Well, I have been one to say all along that December corn futures would never get below 408, that that was going to be like the brick wall of China. Still believe that. And so far, that's come to fruition, and we have one more week to go. <laughs> now, the March contract, I believe, is going to have a little bit of an issue up around the 445 mark, maybe 450. And it, too, will probably water down after the December expires. You'll see the March kind of water itself down. The expectation is, as we go towards the January report, I believe um, it seems to me seven out of the last ten uh, government reports, the November to the January uh, final crop production, increased in corn in the last seven out of ten years and so the, with seeing the Canadian uh, wheat crop increased and the canola uh, sharply in supply um, it's leading that it's leaving that expectation that we're going to see an increase not only this next week's report but in the final and so I think that that keeps an, a hangover on us for just a little bit along with if we see something out of the Fed it'll just kind of Keep us in a range, I guess, for now. You'll see a three in front of corn, I think, in the March contract. But again, there's another market that's leaned heavily short. And so as you go into year end, you're going to see these shorts kind of leveling, these funds level their positions, take some of the money off the table. All right. John, your thoughts on corn? I think that the corn market has played the supply game now for the last several months, at least from maybe September. When we first started seeing corn harvest and we saw the yields were surprisingly good and then in some of the areas, the, the, the states that are not really big producers of corn having phenomenal yields, and they, nobody had storage capacity to handle that size of crop. And it's taken this long to get that crop all put away and get it into secure positions. And, and I'm thinking that's probably just now happening. I'm not sure that it happened, normally it would happen maybe in early November, but I I don't think it, I think we're still there and we've just kind of gotten through that. Um, basis levels are still stronger than they normally are, not substantially like they were. They were a lot stronger, uh, but they're still stronger. And I think that the cash market will lead the futures market up. I don't think we can get enough corn to move out of first ownership with cheaper price levels than we have today. I mean, yeah. the people who are holding on to the corn now, have they're, they're, they don't, they're not ready to sell the corn market up 10 or 15 cents from here. People are waiting for something better. We still have a lot of weather to go through. We want to talk about how big the crop was, but let's face it, the demand is also phenomenal. The, the, the Gulf export capacity, from my understanding, is sold out through the month of January. So if you're going to ship the capacity that, that's required out there and then fill that demand, you're going to have to have corn moving. And so we have to go to a price level cash corn that will allow that adequate movement. I don't think we know where that is yet. Uh, but I do think that we're, we're not far from a rally. We moved close to a sell signal here this week. With a, and with next week, I think we'll probably get into a sell signal. 
we're not going to be very aggressive at selling it, though. We're going to be a little more patient. South America corn production is going to tank compared to last year. They can't make any money. They're not going to plant the amount of corn. They're not going to raise the size of corn. So instead of dealing with the supply burdensome, one of these days we're going to start talking about how small their corn crop is going to be in South America because they can't make any money and how small it will be again next year if price levels stay where they are. So the demand on corn, I think, is what people need to start focusing on. And I think that causes the market some bounce. Nothing crazy, just move to a price level where we can see grain moving out of first hands. We got to see those cash trades pulling it out of the farmer's hands and then the and market will go up. So higher. I think what we're looking at probably is more of a basis move. You know, for the past year, it seems like more than a futures move, it's been a basis, basis move. Mm -hmm. Cattle have done the same thing. And I think that's what we're going to see in the corn is that whenever they need something, they'll feed them a little carrot, dangle a carrot, just to pull enough out, and then the basis will fall back. Um, rail is running about a month behind. So we're not getting stuff moved. And then with this bitterly cold Arctic weather, the wither rivers are going to freeze up, and you aren't going to get those barges moving down like you'd like to. And so that's going to really put a, a demand to get those ships. We have to remember the demand has been phenomenal, both for corn and soybeans, and there's ships waiting to be loaded. It wants to go out the door as fast as it can. But again, uh, we're looking at a situation where I think John's right. The demand is going to help pull it. But again, you know, it's a long, broad situation. The cold winter, more feeding of cattle. But on the same, um, ethanol usage is very good. Another thing, corn is extremely cheap to Chinese corn values. And in the past, on historical charts, Whenever the spread on the uh, two prices is extremely wide, it isn't so much the Chinese price coming down because of government subsidies, it's the U.S. values of corn coming up that narrows that spread. That spread is almost record wide. All right, so reasons there to watch for a bounce in corn. Now, as we take a look over at soybeans, John, you travel quite a bit, and we've been hearing in the soybean market record Chinese demand, record exports. What are you seeing in your travels? How does that demand look? Or do you expect it to continue? The demand really for all the crops, it, and interestingly enough, we're doing the math, getting ready to do some seminars uh, uh, Monday and Tuesday, so putting some graphs together and so forth. The growth in demand for corn, wheat, and beans on the average for the last five years has been a 2.5% increase every year. And that's through some of the worst economic times that we've had yeah. and through the record or near record price levels. And we're increasing worldwide demand by 2.5% every year. So w as we start looking forward, we, we can see it in soybeans, how big the demand has been. There's no reason to expect the demand to really slow. Uh, we would think that the demand will probably be larger than what the, what the government has currently forecast. We think in next week's report, soybean demand will be raised, U.S. soybean demand will be raised, and we think by the time we, we get those bushels adjusted, we think bottom line is we probably don't have very big of an increase in our carryover compared to what it was this I last agree. fall. And then South American crop looks very good right now, looks like a 90 million ton crop or something like that, but they've got to raise it. I was in Argentina last year in January when they were scared to death, they were burning up the crop. We had a nice big rally here. They didn't burn up the crop. They ended up with a record crop. So as it turned out, but just the worry about not getting rain for a three-week period of time took our market sharply higher. And, and so the demand is there. The question is, can we raise the supplies to, to, to take care of the demand? Mm -hmm. Last year, the United States was able to do it. South America was able to do it. This upcoming year, we're just now starting. Let's see how that goes. But demand is solid. All right. Sue? Well, I tend to agree. Demand is very solid. And I think that when we look at the bean market, the one concern I have is, here again, is a market that's record long. And so we're going to see, I think that's holding this market at bay a little bit and causing us to step back. What I think mm -hmm. is, is with the um, uh, demand shift up front and the huge front end loading that we've had by Chinese buying, I think that we have to realize that at some point, yes, this is going to slow, and Copas Secure is saying that their uh, sugar warehouse will be back on deck in time in, by the end of January. So, you know, by the end of May, they maybe should be back shipping to be able to continue to ship out the door. Um, they've got this new road that they're about to be finished by the end of May as well through the Amazon to cut time for trucks to get to ports. I think that. Brazil's going to get their, their arms around the infrastructure. 
But for this year, Chinese know that, that they weren't able to get ships loaded very fast. And I think that we would be really foolish to think that they're going to take and steal our thunder away from us. But we also have to realize, if there's a crop being sold, it's beans. Those are going into the commercial's hands. It's the corn that is sitting in, in the farmer's hands. Mm -hmm. And the biggest percentage of the crop is unsold, which is a big concern. On top of it, not only is it that way here, it's that way in Brazil as well. And there's even some 2012-13 corn unsold in Brazil. That'll be an ongoing story. We're getting short on time. John, give me your, your top 30 seconds on the cattle market. Where do you think we're headed? The cattle market uh, is just kind of struggling in here right now. Uh, uh, the exports have been very good. We had uh, the last couple of months, particularly, we had good export numbers, but we're just having a struggling kind of market. Uh, my hope is here that we're getting uh, with uh, positive economic news and employment news, and maybe we can crank a little demand back up. But struggling kind of a market, steady struggling. It's going to take that growing U.S. economy to really drive demand. Sue, same story on the feeder side, or is there more hope there? Well, I think the feeder market has had some pretty good demand. We all know that. Feedlots wanted to buy as many cattle as they could get. Uh, you had moisture into the uh, wheat pasture, so that was off to a good start, so they had a place to put them out on grass. I think that um, when I look at the cattle market, the, my concern is, is that once we roll the year over, how is the housewife going to keep paying for increased medical costs or insurance costs Somewhere, everything's going up in costs. Somewhere, something's got to give. They're going to start cutting back on their grocery bill. Maybe it's smaller portions, however they want to do it. That is a concern. But in the long term, this winter is going to be a big bullish factor, I believe, for the cattle market. All right. John, now, is that going to have an impact on the pork market as we take a look forward? The pork market, um, I think, is going to focus, I'm going out a little bit further forward, but uh, on, the, on the virus problem that we had last spring into the summer, uh, and uh, we haven't really gotten into that run of hogs yet, but, but that's what's around the corner. So, so from, a, from a difficult market to a better market as we move along into 2014. All right. Thank you both for your time here tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Sue, John, and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment on our website. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed and Facebook account exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll examine the effects of root rot on America's Christmas trees. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Happy holidays. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content.